Hi folks, this is the uh, Big Data Applications and Analytics course in our deep learning section, which is a significant addition uh, starting 2019. And uh, this is the uh, lesson which goes through uh, very quickly the major types of uh, deep learning architectures or approaches. So let's get on with that. Uh, so the things we're going to go through are listed here. Uh, this is the uh, summary of this uh, section, sorry, this lesson. And um, it, uh, these, these may be not all the methods, but they uh, uh, cover most of the important uh, types of deep learning systems you will see. Again, this course is not going to go into the technical details. It uh, will allow you to run them on the Google Colab or uh, in your with the lab sessions on your machines of choice. And uh, but so our goal is not to teach you how to do these things in detail, but to give you an idea uh, what type what what is available and at what is say a person trying to decide what to do in this field you need to know about. All right, so this is the uh, list of um, of uh, learning networks we cover, and uh, they are mainly hyperlinked, or they either hyperlinked or list the link, which gives you more detail. Most of them have several um, places you can go to for detail. Um, a lot of them, uh, there are there are various standard sites such as DeepAI, Machine Learning Mastery, Wikipedia. Which together, which or medium.com, which have lots of nifty review blogs and things like that, and those blogs tend to be reviews of particular features. It's good at this level, where we're trying to capture um, essence of various approaches. So, all right, here we go: multi-layer perceptron, convolutional neural net. Had the next two are really subsets of convolutional neural nets, dropout and max pooling, although dropout is actually usable for most um, uh, deep networks. Recurrent neural nets, and then the two subs, in more probably in practice, more important types of recurrent neural nets, LSTM, long short term memory, and GRUs. <coughs> there are autoencoders, which can either be variational or non variational. Uh, Transformer, uh, which is a new architecture which is competing with LSTM, and it's uh, an example of, a, of an approach that is trying to take sequences and make sequences, whereas, say, autoencoders are trying to take uh, structure, uh, abstract the structure into sort of a hidden variables which describe it well, and then reproduce the structure possibly with less noise or with a Slightly uh, subtle changes and things. Generative adversarial networks are a, an amazing idea where you have two uh, deep networks trained <coughs> which um, compete with each other and together do a better job. So it's a so called unsupervised learning where you would actually have a teacher which um, teaches the student who goes on to exceed, succeed, sorry. All right, then we have reinforcement learning, which is sort of a sophisticated agent-based approach, where you uh, the agent lives in the environment, makes suggestions, and uses that feedback, which is learned to using a deep network. So unlike other approaches to agent-based computing, this is using deep learning networks to implement them. All right, here we have uh, convolutional neural nets, uh, and these are the sort of <sighs> the uh, most typical deep learning network there is, and the, uh, there the original success in image processing were done with CNNs. RNNs were used for language translation and things like that. CNNs were used for images, and those two developments, RNNs for translation, CNNs for images, those created this whole field by taking all the early work, which has been going on for an awful long time, but didn't really realize itself because it didn't have the data and didn't have the computing. Now we have both the data and the computing. So convolutional neural nets are characterized by having uh, uh, 
sparse uh, networks and um, they're, they're used for problems like images which have local structure. And therefore, you need the sparsity to identify that local structure. Um, so CNNs are hugely successful and incredibly sophisticated these days. The, when we go on to discuss image processing and also just CNNs themselves in detail, we will see how sophisticated they are. The most famous CNN from the past, and 2012 I think it was, is AlexNet, which uh, really introduced some of the modern ideas for convolutional neural nets and, did, and won the famous uh, annual uh, image processing co contest. My dropout was, inter was actually used in, uh, in uh, these early networks. It's, there's a paper here which describes it in detail. It's even patented by Google. Sort of interesting. They also, I think, have patented MapReduce. So they, they patent various commonly used things. And it, it's a basically a very clever idea dropout. I mean, th this field has got some brilliant ideas which uh, sort of get um, brushed over in the, in the amazing success. But as there are some parts of the success which is just engineering. But this is a brilliant idea. I don't think this is engineering. This is a brilliant idea. Namely, what you do is you effectively run simultaneously lots of networks. By uh, as you train the network, you you randomly drop various nodes or various links. But you can either do either, um, and. That probability of dropping varies between 20 and 50 percent. I should say the word dropout is sometimes used to um, refer to the probability of being set to zero, and sometimes used to be, represent the probability of not being set to zero. So you will find these numbers reversed in some places. But um, they, the, the value of the dropout rate varies, uh, at least in the Convolutional neural nets between 0.2 on the input, because you don't really want to throw away input values very significantly, because they're real data, and 0.5, which is typically more used in a hidden layer. And it forces neurons not to be too dependent on other neurons. So this is shown here. Here we have a basic uh, fully connected, this one's a fully connected neural net, and here we have. Uh, we just remove some of these neurons. These are the ones with X's, and of course we have fewer connections because the one removed ones are no longer relevant. And effectively, it's a statistical combination of multiple networks. A really interesting feature of these uh, deep learning is how they use statistics. Namely, they use statistically by taking ideas and randomly changing the ideas through the through the process, the stochastic gradient descent, which we did earlier in these lectures, that has the same feature. Um, so, uh, I say this simulates because of this feature the combination of several networks. But obviously, it takes longer to converge, but hopefully, the convergence is more robust. And it's a very powerful method, which is very impressive. Okay, max pooling. It's actually a Sort of lower level idea. It's not at the deep, the critical high level like CNNs or RNNs. It's a, a feature which you, is included in neural network architectures, which is a type of layer. And this is a layer that takes lots of inputs and uh, somehow merges them together. With the max pooling, you are actually taking the maximum value. It's probably the most common pooling layer, but you can also do. Um, Average pooling, you just take the mean of lots of values, and you can also use generalized transformation. And there are papers, if you just go to the internet, you will find many papers on these generalized responses. So it's a way that uh, you can have, uh, and it's often used to, again, solve overfitting and similar problems because you take multiple neurons and merge them into one neuron. And so um, that's, uh, and I say this. This is sort of natural. Obviously, you could, you want to somehow reduce the size and keep the size under control, and pooling is a typical way of doing that. All right, here we have recurrent neural nets. 
And they're an amazing idea. They're actually, in my opinion, a little less obvious intuitively than CNN. CNNs are intuitively pretty clear what's going on. But RNNs are a sort of very clever idea. And they're sort of interesting. They were invented a long time ago. But suddenly, this didn't work until very, until, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago. And since then, they've exploded. And all this work done at that time, which includes actually the improvements of RNNs to LSTMs, um, that was that was all done before they actually since then got used. Yeah, at the bottom here in this picture, we sort of see the essential idea. When you see an RNN represented like that, is secretly lots of um, of um, cells, which um, actually usually are applied to a sequence with the same input going to every cell, and they each you have these inputs which are done systematically, and um, you have these uh, hidden layers, but each cell is actually connected to the next one. This allows you to do the uh, um, time, time dependence. So the idea is you have a set of cells which um, cope with uh, uh, connections, actually either in space or time. Some people use them in space, but the typical use is in time. Here's a much more complicated example, which is actually what's more often used, it's more successful. Um, which is um, an LSTM, uh, long, short-term memory, pretty peculiar name. And they say it was introduced a long time ago. It has this rather complex structure with a set of gates and uh, these uh, various sigmoid um, uh, activation layers. It has a context, which is dependent on time, and a hidden value, which is dependent on time. And you feed those in from the previous cell, you output them to the next cell, and then you process them inside the cells. So it's um, pretty non-trivial. I mean, I, I think it's not something you'd write down intuitively on when you're sitting on your desert island trying to invent deep learning networks. You might, however, in my opinion, write down CNNs. You have a better chance of doing that. GRUs was a suggested modification uh, to simplify LSTMs. Notice LSTMs are really complex compared to the comp effectively simple RNNs shown here. Um, so uh, a lot of the reason the uh, LSTMs and, uh, and GRUs are used is to solve vanishing gradient problems, which we mentioned before. Uh, because they have a longer, because they m remember things over longer distances than RNNs, they therefore have less problem with with the vanishing de derivatives because we have information transferred. Um, and here is a GRU. Here is an LSTM, the most complex, and here is the simple RNN. And I think LSTMs are mainly used, then GRUs, and then RNNs. Autoencoder, they're a brilliant idea. I think actually you, you might invent an autoencoder. Um, and it has a very simple structure. It has an encoder, which basically runs things through a, uh, a uh, deep learning network. That's the encoder. It comes to a magic middle, which has the essence of the, of the uh, Data hidden uh, described in it. It's, it's this I say is very similar to dimension reduction, but much more brilliantly done. And then we have a decoder which takes the uh, essence and expands it back. And when you do that expansion back, you can teach it to do things like avoid noise and or, or change things and things like that. It's a really clever idea. Auto encoders are striking and. Uh, there is on the next slide a description of a variant of this, which is the variational autoencoder, which has a couple of changes. It's got a very distinctive, classic uh, Bayesian likelihood type uh, loss function. And it also tries to learn distributions. In particular, it might learn mean and standard deviations. Whereas um, autoencoders learn values. Anyway, here is a picture of showing how the encoder 
goes to the essence, the latent vector, and then rushes back to reproduce the cat with possibly, again, some changes. Okay. Transformer is a pretty difficult to understand idea again. It is related to RNNs. And it actually, is, there's a picture here from the Google blog of August 2017. It's probably hopelessly out of date. There is something called the blue or blur um, measure of, of translation quality. And the transformer is significantly better. Though notice it's a suppressed scale. Uh, this number here is around uh, uh, 24.5 for uh, RNNs. Um, and then up here we have 28.4 or something, which is the um, transformer. And they have some um, relatively uh, non-trivial structure, which um, is uh, which is designed to include a tension. Um, which is, again, this, this is the same idea as, as an LSTS, but implemented differently, that you must have associated with your learning both the thing that uh, takes your sequence forward, but also something which represents the overall environment in which your sequence lives, so that you can sort of remember the fact that uh, in <coughs> That uh, the type of things that are being described, namely, if you if you're living in a world where cats and dogs are in the sentence, then you're likely to see things about animals and stuff like that. So that's the context. So and then we say this can um, be done by various forms of neural nets, which are illustrated in this diagram here. We will um, hopefully have a, in the applications part of this course a discussion of translation. Uh, generative adversarial networks are an amazing, another amazing idea, which again, you would find hard to invent on your desert island. And it basically has two neural nets, which are illustrated at the bottom here, a generator and a discriminator. Here's the generator. And the generator, the discriminator is trained on the truth, and the generator is trained is trained to produce lies, and they, they compete with each other and thereby actually have a much better, under, can both understand what the truth is better and reproduce fake, in, fake images with, a, with alacrity. Pretty interesting. And the final type of neural net is shown here. It's all of, it's um, a sort of classic um, uh, agent-based system. But the, these agents are basically trained uh, you, to, with a deep learning network to learn from the environment. So they make suggestions about things to do, and they're told uh, the, some information about the quality of their suggestion. And uh, the classic example of doing that is to train uh, mice with cheese and things to get through mazes, which is illustrated by this. Uh, this uh, GIF uh, at the top. There are also lots of videos here. Jesus and mice. Uh, this is uh, one of the more remarkable videos. There's nothing much to do with deep learning, but there's a pretty fun video about uh, uh, how what happens to mice when the world changes and the cheeses move around. Uh, that is a, actually pretty serious for everybody these days because the world is changing. We better change ourselves, or else we're going to be in trouble. Okay, so that's the end of my video on these, um, uh, our overview of uh, uh, deep learning networks. And this is just a snapshot of what we'll do in more detail in the following slides. This is just one slide per concept. And later you'll get typically many slides per concept. Thank you very much. Um, I should say on this picture here, there's even, I forgot to mention this picture here of the uh, actual environment, which is um, shows the uh, environment, the agent which we we learn, which is being learning, the the agent suggests actions, the environment responds, and uh, then some. Then the interpreter tells the agent uh, what's going on and how how well they did. All right, so that's it. Let's uh, go and uh, 
make certain we uh, uh, don't get trapped in the de in the world of yesterday's cheese. So that, which is the serious problem. And actually, these agents better better know that their cheeses could change. All right, thank you.